Good morning everyone and happy Sabbath. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be uh, here with you in this wonderful church, in this most beautiful location during the, this precious time of the year, uh, the fall, when colors are so great and so beautiful. Uh, yesterday we began our discovery uh, why about reformation why reformation was necessary why did it have to happen and i just have a quick question how many of you here have not been there yesterday you can raise your hand okay so the majority of you have actually came yesterday so so you uh, know what i'll be talking about if i'll refer to certain points i'll do a brief summary of what of what i talked yesterday to hopefully to catch up uh, to help you catch up those who are who, who missed uh, but uh, we'll do just uh, very briefly that thing so yesterday we looked at the uh, whole topic why the reformation was necessary why did it have to happen and uh, i made a statement is that it had to happen because the biblical notion of salvation basically went by the wayside uh, it people forgot about paul what paul was saying in about the gospel of jesus christ and they began to move in their own direction in their own way so uh, it already started in the second century okay and we talked yesterday that uh, the, the big question for all ages but in, in second century was for those for those thinkers what must I do to be saved and those people uh, in early Christianity they basically answered okay I need to we need to obey the commandments it's just like I said they almost forgot about Paul and the, the way of being saved was through this technical term theosis or becoming like God you become you become like God and you become better and better through obedience uh, and eventually you achieve union with God and God will embrace you as, as you are. So this was the question that they answered uh, what I must do to be saved. And majority of Christian early thinkers, early Christian thinkers, they actually thought I like this. We need to become better and better and better. And then we talked about um, and that big discussion that happened, real discussion on salvation that happened between two people, Augustine and Pelagius, and uh, I developed this theme yesterday. For those who are a little bit more interested in this, you can view my presentation, I believe it is recorded, so you can find out a little bit more about it. But those people talked about human nature, about the nature of sin, and nature of God's grace. And two uh, extreme have developed out of this discussions two extremes that have been with us in the uh, history of theology ever since and then they are still in Adventism so Pelagius would say that uh, we were born very very good and salvation is essentially obedience to commandments pure salvation by works so I call it uh, salvation by sanctification just purely by sanctification nothing else you just obey commandments and you are going to go to heaven and I developed that theme yesterday during my yesterday's presentation Augustine came on the other hand and he said that we are uh, purely uh, saved by justification but God predestines us that means God decides who is going to be saved that some group will be saved some group will not be saved and he will justify only those who are going to be saved so he believes in predestination he believed in predestination and as a result in the I created this this word picture here that uh, two book ends two ends of kind of understanding of what salvation is on the one hand people believe that they're purely saved by works on the other hand there's absolutely nothing they can do and God predestines them for salvation so works don't play any role whatsoever and in between in between here you have variety of different religions all, all religions Christian and non-Christians uh, actually fit in there so you'd have Islam somewhere here which is salvation by works of course Buddhism Hinduism the, you have Christianity you have uh, uh, expressions of Christianity that teach predestination today and so on so this is a kind of a book soteriological bookmark somewhere in the middle is Roman Catholicism as I uh, made a statement yesterday the Roman Catholic Church could not accept either 
Pelagian view that we are very, very good and we can obey and be saved by obedience, or Augustinian view that we are uh, predestined. Okay, so uh, somewhere in the middle is Roman Catholic Church, but also, as far as the understanding of salvation, somewhere in the middle is Seventh day Adventism. Uh, and, and it takes, it, it is important to understand where we fit in in the whole, whole picture. And I'll, I'll, pr I'll speak about it during my sermon. So, um, what Catholicism does, this is still a bit of a review before we get into the topic of today. You've got uh, salvation by works, purely by works, nothing else except works. The cross of Christ does not play any role in here. And salvation by predestination. And Catholic Church is unable to live with this. And they, basically the Roman th uh, Catholic theologians combine the two view into a middle and develop a kind of understanding of salvation that is a mixture of both. And uh, as I made some st this, this statement yesterday, in this view, some justification is combined with sanctification that means you are saved by faith and works at the same time you you have faith in Christ but also you have to do certain things in order to be saved this is the meritorious understanding of salvation that Ellen White wrote about in great controversy and you are familiar with this this is why the Reformation had to happen because uh, in Catholic Church you basically there's basically believe that we are good enough in such a way that we can work towards our salvation by being baptized, by participating in the Lord's Supper, by doing good things, and, and so on. And in this whole process, priesthood of all believers just got abolished. Because, um, like the New Testament teaches priests of all believers, that we are all priests before God, that we uh, can enter before God's presence. Unfortunately, the early church began to develop a, a caste of people within the church who became priests. And I'll talk about it this afternoon a little bit more, how priesthood of all believers was abolished in Roman Catholicism. And this is a, in combination with salvation by works. You've got priestly mediation, you have to do certain works through the priest God can access humanity or you can access God through the priestly ministry. So this is, uh, this is where Catholicism ended up. So the result was that uh, we see in Catholicism salvation, faith plus works, and I explained that yesterday in detail how it works, so we will not go into this today. So faith and obedience. In, you have to have faith in God, of course, but you obey, and specifically you obey commandments and obey the church's rules, uh, and uh, you will be okay. And uh, there's, of course, mediation, that you do those works through the mediation of the church. The church is, uh, the church is definitely needed. So, in Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism, I made a, that point yesterday, uh, that before Luther, Roman Catholicism became like a salvation vending machine. And this is what you, what you would remember from from uh, talks that the pastors have here and from great controversy that Johannes Tetzel was selling salvation, right? Selling indulgences, going all around the, uh, all Germany, collecting money because the Pope wanted to build, Basil build Basilica of St. Peter in Rome and they needed money, so they devised a scheme that they need to raise funds and they, they started raising funds via selling salvation. So you probably remember this famous saying uh, of uh, Tetzel when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Okay, so this was a famous saying. And uh, so basically, Catholicism before Luther became like uh, a vending machine. You put coins and you receive the salvation. And this is why I stated yesterday that Catholicism, uh, that there was lots of abuse, okay? This, when you combine church with salvation, and church becomes a dispenser of salvation, uh, things can happen in a wrong way. There's a lots of abuse that could happen in the church, and the church was corrupted, uh, thoroughly corrupted by that stage, and reformation had to happen to bring church church back into uh, the biblical understanding of salvation. Although they did, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, the first reformers, they did not do quite a thorough job, and I'll talk about it in a moment. Okay, so the Reformation came and, and needed to demolish this, uh, this thing. So this morning, I will talk a little bit how did uh, 
uh, how did the how did Luther demolish or attempted to demolish? Okay, he didn't. He was not successful entirely. Attempted to demolish the uh, the Catholic understanding of uh, church and salvation and and so on. So uh, we're going to talk about two issues today. Number one, it will be priesthood of all believers, and number two, we're going to talk about uh, the f most important reformational teaching named Soli Deo Gloria, by glory, uh, by, to the glory of God alone for our salvation. So let me begin with priesthood of all believers. Um, I would like to go back, before we, uh, I will explain what Catholicism, how Catholicism sees those things, and uh, let me just begin in the middle of second century, just very briefly. This gentleman that you see on the screen, his name is Cyprian, and uh, Cyprian uh, was a very important thinker for Catholic Christianity, a super important thinker. In fact, uh, you could say that uh, Catholicism today, uh, that the sacramental theology, the priesthood theology, all of it is based on the teachings of this man and everything that was before him. Uh, I usually like to say uh, that he is like an hourglass, you know that hourglass has this narrowing in the middle and then widening. So you've got all kinds of trends uh, in, in the church, understanding of the church before, and then he brings it all together and makes it, uh, uh, makes it very explicit in his theology how the church is supposed to operate. And since then, we've got the church, Catholic Church operating in this way. So he's a very important um, uh, church father as far as Catholicism is concerned. And he died in 258. Uh, he died as a martyr, uh, but, uh, but he, before he died, he was able to produce a body of works in which he explained how church should operate. And he's the first thinker who really systematizes the understanding of a Christian priest. Uh, what, what is the Christian pastor? Okay, he, and I'll speak a little bit more to, to this afternoon about this, uh, but let me just, just briefly refer to this. So what he does, uh, he first of all looks into Old Testament and he says, okay, they had priests. They had priests in Old Testament, and it was a good thing to have priests. Why did we get rid of priesthood uh, in the church? And he, he says, just like the uh, Old Testament had priests, so Christianity should have priests too. And he, he introduces the priestly idea into the ministry of the church. The church, the pastor becomes a priest. And what is the idea that is associated with priestly ministry? It's the mediation. Just like Christ for us Adventists is, uh, mediates for us in the heavenly sanctuary, so the Catholic priests mediate God's, God's grace in the earthly sanctuary. That's why Catholicism has no room for heavenly sanctuary, because everything happens on earth. Uh, so you've got priests who mediate salvation for God, and the Lord's Supper becomes a sacrifice. The priest has to be ordained, because without ordination nothing will happen. He cannot perform uh, the rites, that, uh, like baptism, like the Lord's Supper. And uh, the priest, uh, when he pronounces a blessing on the bread and the wine, they become a real body of uh, Christ, uh, the real blood and body of Christ. Not, not physically, uh, because you don't taste it, but the substance behind it, it's difficult to explain it, but whatever is behind that bread, the, the real thing is the real body of Christ. So when priest actually makes a blessing, and only ordained priest can do that, when he does the blessing, the blessing changes this into real blood and body of Christ, and when he dispenses the host, uh, the, the, the bread and wine, when people eat this, this is where sacrifice of Christ become effective for believers. If you're following this, only by eating, for most of history there was just eating, now they allow for eating and drinking uh, for regular believers. Uh, for most of the church history, when you eat, okay, this is when the grace of God, when what happened on the cross, becomes effective for you. And that's, that's why it's so important for, for Catholics to participate in the Mass, because that's how they receive salvation. 
This is the, this is the way of receiving salvation. So uh, you've got those two elements. Priestly ministry is necessary for this to be, for body of Christ, uh, for the bread and wine to become a body of Christ. Priest can only make it, and then priest can dispense it, and then sacrifice can happen when you eat. Uh, the, the benefit of Jesus' uh, sacrifice can happen for you. And that's, what, that's how the church became a dispenser of salvation. And, and of course it was associated with many, many abuses. And it was associated with one more development. It was associated with the growth of papacy. Uh, soon after, when Cyprian was still writing, there was, the Church of Rome was not an important church. It was just one of the churches. It was important for the empire's sake, but it was one of the churches, all the bishops were equal. But soon after his death, the Bishop of Rome becomes the more important uh, bishop and everybody looks up to him because um, he's, it's a Rome, it's a capital, and then Constantine leaves uh, capital uh, and moves the capital of the empire to Byzantium, today's Constantinople, and leaves the Pope there, and the, basically Bishop of Rome becomes the most important bishop. So the Catholic Church developed into this kind of, um, this kind of organization, institution. It's a pyramidal institution that uh, at the apex here you have a papacy god is above all of this but in order for the ordinary believers to to re to kind of connect to god they have to go through the church the church is the dispenser of salvation so for the believers to go to god and for god to reach believers you've got this kind of mediation right here happening it cannot possibly happen any other way and this is the belief of the church to this day authority flows from above you have to obey what uh, what happens uh, the, the believers have to obey the whatever they are told uh, pope uh, the church is uh, uh, compared to a family the latin word for pope papa means father and all the catholic priests are referred to as fathers when you when you are a catholic you call it the priest father you go father this father can you help me father and something like this so the church is like a family so you obey your earthly father you have to obey your have your uh, churchly father so to speak and you you have to have you have this this kind of uh, obedience so so there's transference of family image in the scripture into the church which is illegitimate transfer but you have this this situation here that those people form a priestly caste there's a special order in catholic church and through them you get to god so uh, what distinguished what distinguishes people in catholic church this is actually a picture of catholic church today as it developed throughout centuries and that's that's how it was in the time of luther what distinguishes this group from this group is the right of ordination and I'm going to talk about the rite of ordination this afternoon uh, at two o'clock. What, what it is, what is the, what was the meaning of it, and and how it changed throughout history, and what the implications for us today as Adventists. So there's a clear distinction. It's not just a blessing or, or anything that is, uh, special, but it's a uh, ordination is the most important rite in Roman Catholicism. The Church will not exist without the rite of ordination. It is impossible. If you took all of the priests and bishops out of the Catholic Church, the mediation would cease and there would be no church. There will be nowhere to go. You cannot reach God. You have to have mediators. And that those mediators are replacement of Christ. Christ is somewhere here below God, but those people are replacement of Christ. They function uh, in Latin, in persona Christi capitis, in the in the person of Christ the head. So those people are the heads in the church. This is the headship, this is the origin of headship in the church. Through ordination they are separated from ordinary believers. And this is the ruling church, this is the teaching church, and this is a sanctifying church. Those are three functions of the priesthood, teaching, ruling, and sanctifying. So you have to obey. You, you have to be obedient to that group of people. And ordination, to top it all, changes people internally. So once you receive a priestly ordination or episcopal ordination, you are a priest forever. You cannot delete this, you cannot change this. So here is a problem that Luther encounters.
okay he he sees this kind of a church he sees that this became corrupt in some way the money is used in fact this is the the, the, the money to build the church as I just said need in in Rome was needed this group of people have sanctioned this they were co collecting money to build the church in Rome and Luther approaches this and he is appalled and he is going to uh, react to this another way to explain this okay and and we'll go to luther after this is that you've got god's grace this is the church like a uh, like a funnel that uh, believers receive the god's grace through sola ecclesia you know we've got this if, um, solas uh, of the reformation sola fide sola gratia uh, solus christus and solido gloria and so on sola scriptura in catholic church is solo uh, sola ecclesia if you want to go to God, you can only go to God through the church. You cannot get to God through uh, in any other means. And therefore, within Catholicism, and already had this on previous slide, is this statement, uh, extra ecclesiam nulla salus, outside of the church there is no salvation. Uh, Catholics, for the last 50, 60 years, uh, just kind of adjusted this phrase. They allowed that even we Adventists could have uh, some parts of uh, churchly uh, reality. They would call us ecclesial communities. They don't call us um, church. We can cannot be a church the only church is the church that has fullness of God's grace which is the Roman Catholic Church but salvation can be found in some places like like Adventism even our baptism is would be recognized by Catholics as long as it is done in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit it would be recognized by a Catholic <coughs> you would not have to be rebaptized you will only receive the confirmation if you decided to become a Catholic uh, but uh, but up until Ruth Luther's time and definitely up until about 1950s and 60s uh, this was the basic idea you have to be part of of the church you have to be a member of the church if you want to be saved everybody else is heretics and problematic people and they will not be in heaven if you want to be in heaven you have to come to church and once you join the church you get priestly mediation here and you get God's grace so Luther comes in he looks at this situation and through his study through his work he says absolutely not this is uh, and of course he was motivated at first by what was happening in Germany with this collection of the indulgences and so on and he doesn't like it he he hates it but of course there's other things that were motivating him that I'm going to talk about during the sermon today uh, but he comes up he basically does he does this okay uh, from this system on the left this is his breakthrough number one that we're going to talk about he does this okay basically takes out the mediation of the church suddenly uh, this is this become you can have direct connection between you and God there's no need for anything in between there's no need for churchly mediation and this is what what is meant by this uh, term sola fide by faith alone it's not by the church it's not by doing things that are connected to the church it's sola fide by faith alone that I can reach God I don't need church there's there's no need for for this mediator here okay sola fide becomes the uh, rallying cry for uh, for luther and and you you've heard this probably in the sermons before here sola fide by faith alone not by mediation of the priest not by having pastors in the church but by my direct connection with God so this is the direct contact with God that I can have uh, luther then he said priesthood of all believers okay this is the whole idea this is not a priesthood of all believers this is priesthood of special people in the church that's it this is priesthood of ordained people in the church this is not priesthood of all believers he takes it out and he says we all priests we are all priests 
Okay, this is the going right back to what Peter was saying that we are all royal priesthood, priesthood of all believers. So the, simply what it means is that we do not need the church to mediate between me and God. That's the bottom line of, of this phrase. And we're going to develop this, uh, this, this thing a little bit more today, uh, later on at uh, 2 o'clock. So, uh, and, the, and the third one, a very important one, so you've got all the solas here, there's of course sola gratia by grace alone here, sola scriptura. When, if you are a Catholic, then you do not need re, do, do not need to read the Bible on your own. Uh, nobody is requiring you to read the Bible. For the last 50 or 60 years, Catholics have been encouraging uh, their believers to read the Bibles, but when you read the Bible, you need to go for interpretation to the church. So you, you need to read your Bibles in tandem with Catholic Catechism, and if you don't understand something in the Bible, go into the other authoritative source, which is Catholic Catechism, and Catholic Catechism, or your priest will explain to you what the Bible means, and this is what is important. This is where you, what you accept, this is what you believe, this is where you go to. You don't go to the Bible, you go to the Catechism. And if you want to talk to the priest, great, but read your Bible, great, but if you have questions, go to the the priest, priest will explain, catechism will explain. For us as Adventists, this is uh, for, for Protestantism, uh, Luther says absolutely not. Uh, I don't need a, somebody to explain the Bible to me. I can read it by myself and find out what the Bible says. And this was one of the breakthroughs of Luther that he, uh, he translated the Bible from Latin into German. And this is the real beginning of the Reformation, you know, when people open the Bible, they read the uh, translation and he used the newly released uh, translation from Greek, or Greek Bible uh, published by Erasmus that was just recently published and he translates this into German and suddenly people realized we read the Bible and we find out that things don't work together with what being taught in the church and and uh, things don't square up with the bible and and suddenly people wake up and this is the uh, this is where the reformation spread when they started reading luther's uh, translation so sola scriptura simply means that there's no mediation you don't have to go to the priest you can open the bible read for yourself and and you will find out what is in uh, what is in the uh, scriptures. Uh, this whole thing, whole thing that you see here, and especially this sola scriptura and removal of priesthood of believers, uh, priesthood of uh, 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 the caste, special caste, removal of necessity of having those people in the church, the mediation, became known in, in the history as Protestantism's dangerous idea. Very dangerous idea. Why was it dangerous? You know, uh, to the supporters of the Reformation, uh, those who were supporting it, it was a great breakthrough. It was a wonderful thing. It was something that was absolutely necessary. Uh, it was returned to the Bible. Uh, it was liberating from oppression of the church, from this uh, selling of salvation and so on. But to the opponents of the Reformation, uh, this was a huge problem. And, and, and people saw this as a huge problem. Here is, you've got society organized in a specific way that has been organized for many, many years. So this system impacted not only the church life, but it also impacted the social life, impacted the greater society uh, within which the medieval Christianity functioned. So suddenly you tell somebody that uh, you don't need the mediation. For us it's obvious, okay? For us it's, it's like breathing, okay? We don't think about it. But when you are uh, in that society, it's, it's something like uh, suddenly the government of the United States tells you you need to drive on the left-hand side, like we drive in Australia, okay? Uh, from today, you leave the church and you, from now on, everybody drives on the left-hand side. You know what, what would happen? It would be a chaos, absolute chaos, okay? There will be tons of accidents. So, so you can put it on a scale of a society and you've got chaos. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, that's why it was such a dangerous uh, idea. Because at the heart of all of the questions was who can define faith for me? Do I define the faith for myself? Or do I uh, allow somebody else to define faith? Up until that stage, it was the church who defined faith for you, what you believe. It was the church who told you what to believe. 
But now Luther comes and says, no, 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 no. We, we don't need mediation of the church. I can define for myself. And you can imagine that everybody reads the Bible and they come up with different interpretation and you've got all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues, and Protestantism has splintered. So it became a radical, uh, radical idea, a good idea, I think. I, I, it's necessary idea, but it was radical. And it led to splintering of Europe to some extent, to different Christian denominations, different Protestant denominations, and eventually it led to the rise of, uh, of our own church. So it was a radical and dangerous idea because a centralized authority was removed. Up until that stage there was unity, people believed the same thing, looked up to the papacy and bishops for guidance, suddenly all of it is gone. So it resulted in chaos within Christianity and chaos in the, uh, in the society. But uh, God had his fingers in it, it had to happen. It was absolutely necessary. Uh, so this is the one thing that, uh, that, that was the result of this breakthrough of Luther, that from the having priestly caste, now we have individual access to God. I can go to God and I can talk to God, I can pray to Him and He will forgive me and He will be with me, He will love me. I don't need the church to tell me that. So this was, this was the amazing breakthrough and we as Adventists are definitely following, uh, I hope, following in that, uh, that kind of thinking that we, uh, each one of us, we don't need a pastor's caste in our church to, to have a relationship with God. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more this afternoon. Okay, so this is breakthrough number one. Let me talk a little bit, I've got 20-25 minutes left, a little bit about the second breakthrough that was uh, very important. Uh, most often we are hearing um, that pro Protestantism, the Reformation, was about sola fide, sola gratia, and sola scriptura. Those are the basic three solas that we know. Sola fide means by faith alone, that we receive justification by faith alone, not through priestly mediation. Uh, sola gratia means that this is by grace alone, by God's grace alone. And um, sola scriptura means that we do not need interpretation of the church, we do not need traditional interpretation of the scripture, sorry. Uh, we can read the Bible for ourselves. Sola fide, sola gratia, and sola scriptura. But we don't often talk about sola soli deo gloria. There's also another one, solus Christus, that Christ alone, we don't need uh, any other headship in the church, Christ alone is the head of the church, uh, which in Catholic Church, of course, the priests are the heads of the church. But soli deo gloria, we do not often talk about. But this is a foundational, this, this, this principle soli deo gloria lies at the very foundation of the reformation this is the bottom line this is that's just like some everything else is built on this uh, on this idea of soli deo gloria that glory to god alone for my salvation catholicism built a system that we could say deo e homini gloria glory to god and humanity so, so you give glory to uh, God for what he accomplished, for the cross and for other things, but you also give glory to yourself for obeying the commandments. I've done well, okay, I obey the commandments, so, so there is some glory to me, okay, and God rewards that thing. And, and, and finally he says, well, you obeyed well, you've done well, so come enter the uh, heaven. Uh, and of course for Catholics it happens when they die because they believe in immortality of the soul. So there's a glory to, to me also. So you've got this distinction between, uh, between glo uh, Deo e homini gloria and soli Deo gloria. That's what the Reformation was all about. Soli, soli, soli Deo gloria. It was his slogan, glory to God alone. It was a slogan of the Reformation. It was teaching of the Reformation. And, of course, uh, associated with this is the uh, definition of uh, justification. This is Luther's de definition of justification, that we can agree with this solid or glorious Adventist. We can agree with this, although, let's, let's see. The doctrine of justification is this, that we are pronounced righteous and are saved solely by faith in Christ and without work. Uh, do you have any problem with this definition? 
Okay? I mean, when you read it, that, okay, what is justification? That I'm pronounced righteous and I saved solely, that means only by faith in Christ, that I put my faith in Christ. Christ saves me. He provides the cross, the, the, his sacrifice on the cross, and then I accept it by faith without work, right? Sounds, sounds wonderful, okay? But this is not the end of story. And, and this is where we as Adventists eventually, and later I will tell you who, departed from Luther on this issue, um, because it led into a unexpected alley. So, so let me just address uh, address what uh, what was Luther's teaching. Okay, when Luther was a monk, when he uh, when he worked as a monk, he struggled with the assurance of salvation. It was a real problem for him. He never felt that he was good enough in the eyes of God. He always felt that he could have been more obedient, uh, that there were more ways in which he could please God, and God will not accept me uh, until I'm a better person. Uh, why? Because in Catholic Church there was this teaching that salvation is by obedience. So the better you obey, the more you will be accepted by God. So you have to really obey to be accepted. And he never felt uh, that he was, he was good enough. So, uh, as a monk, he struggled with assurance of salvation. He, he just, uh, I mean, you can read about this in, in Great Controversy, and I'll talk a little bit during my sermon about this. Uh, he never felt that he was good enough in God's eyes. This was like, like I'm never good enough. And he would, uh, he would really worry about it, and, and it would be a problem for him. Uh, and he didn't know what to do with this. God will not accept me until I become a better person. Okay, so this was, uh, this was his basic idea. Uh, um, uh, when he was a monk. And then he became a Bible student. It was his mentor, Johann von Staupitz, who uh, suggested that go back to Romans, read Romans, okay? Read Romans and then see what happens in Romans, okay? And he, we, he becomes a Bible student. And this is before uh, 1517, before he nailed his thesis. The nailing of thesis is, uh, this is a capping stone of a, a few years of solid study in the book of Romans and, and uh, other things, okay? So Luther is a student and he discovered, as he he carefully studies the book of Romans. He writes a commentary on the book of Romans. Uh, about 1515, he completes that on the basis of his lectures. He discovers the truth about human nature. And this is, a, uh, this is a, uh, the fundamental breakthrough. This is the part of the genius of the Reformation. Uh, he discovers that he will never be good enough. He will never be good enough to earn salvation. It is impossible that he, impossible altogether, he will always be a sinner. He will never reach the point when God will say, you good enough to reach salvation. It is impossible. This was a huge breakthrough. So he discovers that he will always be a sinner. Okay, so this is that famous uh, phrase that he comes up, simul justus et peccator, at the same time justified and righteous. Okay, so he says, I will never, never, ever be good enough to, uh, to be saved. And then he discovers that, uh, that he, can, he can never earn God's grace. He can never go to heaven through his works. He will never be able to earn God's acceptance because it's a gift. It is God's gift. So this is the theme of soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone for He gave to us. Okay? It, it is God's gift. Uh, eternal life is a gift from God. It's a major breakthrough. Uh, this, is, this is what I call the genius of the Reformation. This is why the Reformation needed to happen. Because Catholic Church taught that there is some inherent goodness in us. So when they teach that there is inherent goodness in us, and if, you, need to, if you, you want to know more about this, then you need to listen to my lecture yesterday uh, that I presented down in, in the uh, function room there. But the Catholic Church taught that there is some inherent goodness in us. And if there is inherent goodness in us, therefore our good works are really good. They're not bad, they, they're good, okay? And if they are good, then God has to reward them. Just like my work for the seminary is rewarded with a salary, so, and it's a just thing to do. My, what I do, I need, to, they, I need to pay my bills, so they pay me. Okay, so God actually sees, oh, those are good works. So, so God rewards those good works that you do. This is traditional Catholic teaching. And, and Luther realizes that his good works will never be good enough. 
No matter how good he is, no matter how well he does things, they are never good enough. No matter how perfectly he obeys the commandments, it's not good enough. Because he is he's really he discovered the truth about about human nature because we are so damaged by uh, by sin, by the fall. So, but Luther goes further. And this is, if he stopped here, then we could agree with him. All, all of this stuff up, up until here, we can say, wonderful, okay? But Luther was so opposed to Catholic system of earning salvation. He was so opposed to, um, to the, the, uh, the, this, this whole machine of, of distributing of salvation, the human element, that he goes to the other extreme. So what does he do? Okay, how are humans saved? So I'm, I'm completely damaged. I'm just nothing, okay? I cannot earn my salvation. None of my works uh, are good enough. So he embraces the teaching, which we as Adventists can also embrace, but it takes us in a different direction, as I'll, um, I'll explain just in a moment, that we are born sinners. Okay, we are totally depraved, and this is still okay. That that, uh, but he takes it to even even further. Okay, even even a little bit, little bit to. Uh, he, he believes we are totally and absolutely dependent on God for salvation and renewal, and this is true, but he even takes it further than that. Okay? He begins to accept this thing, and this is before he nailed uh, the 95 Thesis, that justification is not what happens to me when I accept Jesus by faith. Justification happens in eternity past, when God embraces me before I am even born. In other words, he embraces the teaching of predestination. And uh, it is not a surprise to me, uh, and many people don't know this, that Luther was predestinarian, but he was. He was a strict predestinarian. Uh, we usually think predestination is associated with Calvin, but Luther was even more predestinarian than Calvin. We just don't talk about it much. Uh, he was an Augustinian monk. Right? He was an Augustinian monastery, as I explained uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Augustine was the first one to teach this kind of thing, and Augustine did get some things wrong and did get some things right. So not everything that Augustine taught was wrong. And, but Luther embraces Augustinianism through and through. The, the, the whole thing. Okay? So Luther believes that God elected me before the creation of the world, God knew that when I'll be born, I'll be elected. He will elect me and I'll be justified. Okay? So this is, uh, you can imagine that this whole idea of predestination, as much as for some of us doesn't make sense, it made sense for Luther. Because it went hand in hand with this whole idea, solido gloria, which is a great idea, but he took it too far. That even my choice, okay, in justification, when God comes to me and I realize that I can be justified, God offers me his gift of salvation, and now I have a choice to say yes or no. When I say yes, he said, it's a human element. And he was so opposed to any kind of human element, including a power of choice of your salvation, that he embraced the idea of predestination, where there's no human choice. There's no choice. You don't choose to be saved, you don't choose to be damned. If you don't want to know more about it, this is my yesterday's lecture. There's just no choice. Uh, so uh, this is how he reacted against Catholicism. He just went a little bit too far. He embraced the Augustinian teaching of predestination where there's zero choice. God just elects you in the past and if you are going to be justified, uh, or other way, if you are predestined for salvation, you will be justified, you will embrace God, you will be baptized, you will be part of the church, and you will go to heaven. Because it's all in a grand design of God. So, uh, what you see here is this, uh, this combi Catholic combination of, justifi of justification and sanctification. They merge together. So you are judged on your works, how well you obey. That's basically what, what it is. And Luther comes in, Reformation comes in, and they break this thing 
away completely. And Luther basically says, you are only safe by justification. Sanctification works, good works, whatever you do doesn't really matter. This is uh, justification only plays the role in salvation. That's it. That's what, what him sola fide means. There's uh, no works involved at all. There's no human response. There's just nothing in it. Uh, that, that is ascribed to humanity. Everything is done by God. God does everything. And this is what he meant by soli deo gloria. This is what the Reformation by soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. It's, it's his grace alone. This is not my doing. I don't have a part in it because God predestined me in the past. And here I, I'm just, if I'm a Christian, that means I'm elect. And I love Jesus, that means God elected me. If I don't, that means that God did not elect me. So you can see that in his great desire, in this huge desire to remove any form of human works from the process of salvation, Luther embraces the radical idea of predestination. And Calvin follows him, and Zwingli follows him in, in this idea. So, okay, uh, what is the role of believer? Okay, what is the role of believer in this kind of system? What, what do I do as a believer? Uh, the answer is simply nothing. 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 Uh, Luther would tell you, just believe, trust that you are elected. You know, when I was a student, uh, I uh, always wondered, uh, when I was doing my studies at Andrews University, why is Luther so stuck on this definition uh, of faith? Because that's how Luther defined faith. Faith is trust that God will fulfill his promises. Faith is trust that God fulfills his promises. And I always wondered, what does it mean? Faith is trust. And then hit me some years ago, hit me that trust means that he trusts that he's elected. Okay, that he's elected for salvation, therefore he doesn't have to worry about his works. Yes, he will do good works because God will incline him to do, but he doesn't have to worry because he's elected. And this is what happened to Luther when he understood this kind of, uh, when he understood this, this teaching, okay, this is his breakthrough. Remember when he's struggling and fighting and cannot understand uh, how can God love him because he's not good enough and suddenly it hits him, I'm a Christian. I'm baptized. I go to church. I participate in the communion service. I'm a, I'm a monk. I'm a priest. I'm elected. And suddenly this realization hits him. I'm saved. I don't have nothing to worry about. You see how it works? So, so this, is where he, this is the point where he arrives to this, and this is where he rebels against the system, uh, against the system, Catholic system. He basically says cooperation, and I had that picture uh, yesterday, the cooperation between God is impossible and human beings. You just cannot, cannot cooperate in any form of shape, because God does it all. God is in charge entirely of salvation. He does it all. Soli Deo Gloria. It's a wonderful slogan, but, uh, but in the mouth of Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, it means predestination, that God predestined us, that we do not have uh, any possible choice in our uh, salvation. So, eventually, the Lutheran Reformation, the, the Magisterial Reformation, and this is the Reformation of Luther, uh, of Calvin and of Zwingli, they called Magisterial Reformation because they associated themselves with the uh, civil government, the magistry, okay? All of them embraced this kind of teaching that you, you can see. Uh, and this is where we're going to end in a moment. So, God makes decision in the past, Okay, God makes decision in the past who is going to be saved. So, so he, in his foreknowledge, he knows that you'll be saved, 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 but the rest of you will be damned. And there's nothing you can do about this. This is impossible to change. Uh, so you've got two groups of people currently living on earth, those who are saved and those who are lost. And uh, there's no revision, okay? What it says here in the middle, no revision. You cannot, you cannot jump. If, you, if God saves you, you're saved. If you're elected, you will be saved whether you want it or not. And this is the teaching that you're probably familiar with, once saved, always saved. Okay, you probably heard that. It goes back to uh, Calvin, but Luther believed that as much as uh, Calvin did. So on the basis of God's decision, there's two groups of people, no revision. 
okay and this group uh, this group uh, below is lost and they are not going to be saved so they don't even experience conversion they don't even know that they are lost they, they, they just have no idea that they lost they will never ex be baptized um, this is just like no point bothering about this group of people on the other hand these people who are going to be saved are going to experience conversion if you are elected you will experience conversion and then you trust God sola fide you trust God by faith alone by sola fide that you are in this group of people so you see that uh, when I say sola fide as Adventist is something different than what Luther said sola fide he trusted that he was predestined I trust in the blood of Christ okay and and it's a different kind of story and uh, so, so this is in a nutshell, very briefly, uh, where, where this under, trying to understand the process of salvation, where it took Luther. It took him to the other extreme, the other extreme. So, uh, in this way, that far we cannot follow Luther. Okay. Uh, so here I've got this, this almost final diagram. What is the human role of salvation, contrasting the two systems that uh, we talked about? We've got Catholic Church on the left, and we've got Lutheran, Calvinistic, and Zwinglian Reformation on uh, the right. So uh, on the left, the church. Everything depends on the church. Okay. Uh, church decides who is going to be saved. Uh, you have to go to church for mediation, for salvation. It is all up to church. Church is everything. Human works play a huge role. Uh, on the right for the Reformation, God decides who is saved. You don't have a choice in this. You don't make decision. It is God who makes the decision who is going to be saved. On the left, you've got faith grace and obedience that means yes god is gracious and merciful catholic church believes that merciful and gracious and but you also good enough to obey you can obey the commandments okay uh, for the reformers it was all grace and nothing else there was no obedience okay obedience was not part of the equation obedience to commandments was not part of the whole thing even saying yes to uh, to god was not part of this uh, of the picture because God elected you in eternity elected you in eternity past so it was grace and nothing and cooperation obedience to God's commandments uh, so you cooperate with the church you obey God's commandments Catholic Church believes in the obedience of Ten Commandments definitely here it's God's operation alone obedience is not part of the equation not part at all so what you see in the desire to purify Christianity uh, purify Christianity altogether from uh, this Catholic idea of obedience of ability to obey that I can earn my salvation he went a little bit too far and he embraced the radical idea of uh, predestination that that God can el God elects us and he chooses us and then if you are baptized if you're part of the church if you, if, if you are spiritually inclined that means that God elected you and you've got nothing to worry this is the ultimate foundation for Luther's belief in uh, salvation soli deo gloria so where are we on this thing as Adventists okay where, where are we okay what uh, are we closer to Catholicism closer to the Reformation we are somewhere somewhere and this is why we often argue in Adventist Church about the doctrine of salvation uh, because um, different people are closer to one or the other view okay and we don't have clarity I hope my sermon will provide some clarity for you today uh, but this is why Reformation was not finished this is why Reformation continued okay God called other people to continue the Reformation he called Philip Melanchthon who was a very close associate of um, of Luther and who loved Luther to bits who systematized Luther's writings uh, who was follower of Luther but he did not accept one thing he did not accept predestination 
Okay, he originally did, but then in the 1530s he moved away from it and eventually said, no, 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 I can't accept this. And, and, and Melanchthon, because of this, becomes a uh, forefather of Adventism in some way, some way. We look to him as the source of the idea of how we saved, uh, in what way, because he allows for the element of free will that God recreates in us, okay, because when, when Adam when Adam uh, committed his sin, he basically became totally depraved. Notice one thing, and scripture is very clear on this, uh, that uh, Adam hid, okay, he, and who, who goes to look for him? Uh, it's God who goes to, goes to look for him, okay? He searches, oh, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And, and God is crying, looking for, for Adam, and uh, only then Adam is able to respond after God searches for him. Adam does not search for God. You know, Adam sins and he doesn't run to God, he hides. He lost the ability to reach to God, uh, so God has to reach to him. So this is, this is a wonderful thing that Reformation taught us, that God initiates salvation. Uh, but God recreates, Ellen White would say, this, is much, uh, this presentation is part of a much longer presentation, I'm giving you a very brief, uh, brief summary here. But Ellen White would say that God recreated a free will in Adam after the fall, allowed him to be a free human being once again. So it is God initiative. Then Jacobus Arminius comes, and nobody ever heard about Jacobus Arminius, but very important Dutch theologian. We are, as Adventists, we are Arminian. We follow his understanding of salvation to some extent. Not everything that both of them taught, but he, the understanding of salvation that he presented, that he rejected the predestination, but embraced everything else of the Reformation. And then comes John Wesley. And John Wesley embraces Arminius. Okay, John Wesley was Armenian. He, uh, he uh, even for, a, for some time, he ran a magazine that was called Armenian Magazine. He read Arminius, he studied him very carefully, and, and uh, developed his system of salvation. Imperfect, uh, needed to be adjusted, but he developed something that was much better than in the past. And then, what denomination did Ellen White come from? She was a Methodist, okay? So she was in, she was in Wesleyan tradition. So, so she brought into Adventism the late Wesleyan, uh, late Wesley. This is in his end of his life when he comes up to a, to a, a good understanding of salvation. Uh, Ellen White embraces the thing. And Ellen White is decidedly Wesleyan in, in, in the way she writes in many ways. So, so you can see this, this continuing reformation where we finally arrive to, and this is skipping many centuries here, we finally arrive to what Adventists are and, and who we are. So we are thankful to Luther what he accomplished. We're thankful for this whole concept of solideo gloria. We're thankful for his recognition that human, as humans we can never earn salvation. It is impossible for us to earn salvation. It is impossible for us to keep commandments good, well enough that God will embrace us and take us to heaven on the basis of our obedience. This is a wonderful thing. But Luther goes further. He goes and embraces this predestination idea because he wants to remove all human works from, uh, from equation. Even choice is a, is a work. And therefore, Reformation needed to continue. And, and we arrive at, at Adventist understanding of uh, salvation and we struggle for many years. We struggle then, uh, first 40 years, we think about obedience, obedience, obedience. And then during the General Conference in Minneapolis, we discover Christ's righteousness, uh, another story altogether, another history of Adventism here. And, and in Adventism, we do struggle between those two elements, grace and obedience, grace and obedience. And I'll talk about it during my sermon. Thank you very much. Oh, we can have a prayer. Okay. Let us bow for prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much that we are able to see your hand throughout the history of Christianity. Even when Christianity was mired in these dark ages, in the, the worst possible situation, there was always your grace shining through somewhere. And this grace came back again in the teachings and the lives of the reformers, and they initiated this uh, wonderful discovery that you are the only responsible party in the process of salvation, that you are the one who gives us the gift of salvation, and we can never earn our salvation, and we're grateful for that. And then Reformation continued until we arrive at who we are today. 
I just thank you, Jesus, that you placed us at this moment of history. We can look back and we can say that we are standing on the shoulders of giants and we can learn from them. I pray that you bless us in our continuing study, continuing understanding of what, who we are as far as in, in relationship with you. And thank you for loving us. In your name we pray. Amen.